Happy to be here at GopherCon. Uh, like they said, I was the first GopherCon hire at CrowdStrike. Um, so it's really great to be back and be able to talk and actually talk about stuff at CrowdStrike. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a, that's too far. There we go. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a senior software developer at CrowdStrike. Um, a little background about CrowdStrike. We are a cybersecurity company and we ingest over a trillion messages a day into our distributed graph database called ThreatGraph. Um, kind of the basis of the company is that we have sensors all over you know, the servers and laptops and desktops and mobile devices of all of our customers. And they use um, our cloud to be able to send us different data about what might be going on in the system so we can have a global resource pool of all of the events that happen throughout our network. So we're able to use that to build different data models and really protect the entire network live. Um, so to do that, we need to process a lot of messages. We need to process a lot of data and get it into our cloud. So today I'm going to be talking about that um, for how we, how we kind of build this architecture and are able to troubleshoot it and do that live. Um, so this is going to be a talk about asynchronous architectures. These are also called event-driven architectures. Um, it's relatively um, common concept in modern cloud computing. Um, where you have different microservices, you know, service A, B, and C. Um, a gets a message, sends it over to B. B then takes that message, does some processing, sends it to C. You know, asynchronous. Um, these are very common because they're very fault tolerant. Um, they are able to ingest a large amount of data and process that. And they're able to do that because it doesn't necessarily have to be time dependent. So you might have a low lag time where you're able to process something through the pipeline in milliseconds. Um, but you want to have the architecture available um, so that you are able to ingest all of that information um, and then process it whenever you have the CPU cycles or resources available to process it. So if you get a large um, chunk of messages for whatever reason all of your devices are sending, you know, millions of messages or in our case, you know, hundreds of millions of messages a second, um, then you might end up with a small backlog and you can work through that where in other times you might uh, you know, have lower need for, for latency. All right, so let's talk a bit about the, the current state of the art for testing um, architectures. So very baseline is unit tests. So this is the absolute minimum for um, any, any kind of Go application is writing your unit tests. If, if it doesn't have a unit test, it's not done. Um, allegedly. Um, they're relatively easy to write. These tend to be very small. Um, if you're writing unit tests correctly, you're writing them on a per function basis to, or per method basis um, to basically verify that it's doing what you're, you're intending to do. So if you write uh, a function that reverses you know, a slice, um, you want to write a unit test to make sure you know, if you put in a bunch of random different slices, does it reverse it properly? Are there any bugs or other things you need to do? Um, and these also tend to be service specific. So it's very rare that you'll have a unit test do cross service um, functionality tests, especially now that um, Go is a lot more modularized and you'll have different services in different modules. Um, so for most cross dependencies, you won't be really writing that many unit tests. Um, and it's uh, generally limited to that scope. So although you can you know, theoretically write different unit tests and mock data, um, so, for instance, if you have a Redis uh, application, um, you want to be able to talk to it, you can mock those messages coming in and out of it um, and kind of get that data there. But once you go up to a, you know, against a live Redis cluster, then that would go into integration tests. Um, integration tests are also one of the um, core foundations of testing your architecture. Um, they're um, basically something that you can run in a development or production environment that allows you to verify that your services are talking together. So if your service needs to talk to Cassandra or Kafka or Redis or your service needs to talk to another service, um, this is where you would write those integration tests. Um, they're, they're relatively straightforward. Um, they will usually include injecting some kind of real or mock data into the system and seeing what you get. So for instance, if you have a RESTful API, um, then it's very easy to test. You can very simply um, go into your uh, API, send it a message, say, you know, hey, I, I'm sending you this message and expect to get some kind of response from that. Um, so RESTful responses or really any kind of request response, fairly easy to test. 
did I get what I expected? Yes, no. Cool. Um, it's also relatively easy to test for very simple asynchronous flows. So if you have a single service that, say, writes to a database, you can inject a message into that service, and then you can verify, oh, um, did it actually show up in the database like I expected it to? Um, so the problem is, is that asynchronous pipelines can get incredibly um, complex incredibly fast. Um, so let's uh, kind of take a look at this use case where we have some service A, it writes to B, B does some uh, you know, analysis on that message and then it writes it to C. C creates a very complex message and writes it back to A. A then writes it to D and E, D sends it to a database, E sends out an email. Um, so this is based on a real you know, kind of flow. It's relatively common that you might have you know, something coming to your pipeline and it spawns just a bunch of processes as part of your asynchronous architecture. Um, the, the problem is, is that it's, there's a couple different layers for how you could do this with integration tests. So for instance, if you have um, an integration test where you want to check to make sure it got in the database, you send it to A, and then nothing happens. Um, it's fairly common. There could be queue lag. Um, you could have injected into the queue, but there was you know, a, a million 10 million whatever backlog, and so it won't process immediately. Um, and so you have to continually pull your database to see if it got there, and then eventually time out. So the test could have failed because it never got to D, or it could have just been delayed, um, or it could have been le dropped legitimately. Um, so if you were to send it to A, you know, how do you know that it didn't get dropped at B or dropped at C? Um, you could theoretically um, you know, simulate the message that came from C and put it into A, or simulate the message that came from A and put it into D. Um, the problem is, is that at that point, you have to write very manual mocks. You have to write data that is essentially allowing you to verify what came out of your previous service, which if you know, you've ever worked with developers, you can absolutely rely on them to never update their integration tests. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, because it's, it's hard. It takes time. And it's, it's very difficult to keep those updated and keep those up to date um, in a very robust way. Um, so before I keep going, let's talk a little about the last point of testing, tracing. Um, I absolutely love tracing. So tracing is a um, just incredible, uh, incredible way to look at your data. So things like open tracing, um, uh, tracing IO, uh, Jaeger, all of the you know many tools I won't really get into here um, will allow you to have really robust um, views into your architecture. Um, so if you um, take in a message, each service can then uh, send to a central data lake um, all of the attributes of that message as it goes through the system. So when it goes into A, A then sends up a message, hey, I got this message, I sent it over to B. B then gets the message, it sends up a, a common uh, message to the data lake that says, I got this message from A, and I'm going to you know, take these different parts of it and kind of move through the architecture. So as you go from A to B to C, all of them are uploading that data um, into a central data lake so that it can kind of make a full view of the picture. So you can see all of the steps that this message is taking as it traverses through your system. And this is fantastic. I highly recommend it. We do actually um, have tracing at CrowdStrike, um, but we're not able to have the same level of tracing for a lot of our asynchronous pipeline because we get a trillion messages a day. By the time I started this talk, we've processed, you know, probably a billion, yeah, definitely a billion messages. Um, so we don't have the, there isn't a data lake big enough for us to ingest all of those messages. Um, so really, it's something that we need to be able to do in a more robust way. Um, so before I get into how we do that, we're going to talk about context in Go. Um, I have opinions on this, and I'm going to share them with you. Um, so context is one of the most powerful things in Go and also one of the worst things in Go. Um, if you use it correctly, it is amazing. Context allows you to add a context to your downstream uh, method calls and your functions. So if you use it correctly, it's great. Um, so number one rule, 
don't attach things you want your function to call or data you want your function to have. These are very common, especially for new developers coming from you know, Java environments or things like that, where they want to just put, pack in stuff to context so they don't have to add params to their function line, um, which is great. You know, it's, uh, it's, very, it's very normal for, for new developers who want to use this as their kind of just central repository for all of their parameters that they could possibly pass to the next function. Um, the problem is, is that it's incredibly hard to debug. Um, and it doesn't allow for the same robustness that you get um, and that you can expect to get with a strictly type language like Go. Um, and generally, you should not have anything in context that modifies how your function fundamentally works. So if you have some kind of you know, value or parameter in context and the, the result of that context will wildly change what your function is doing, you've used context wrong. Um, now, some do's are absolutely used to think for things like logging and tracing. Um, that's what it's there for, is so that if you are you know, adding a customer ID or you know, a device ID or a message ID or you know, trace ID or whatever that is, it's not necessarily a parameter that you need for your function, um, but it's something that you want your uh, downstream loggers and tracers and you know, modifiers to be able to use so that when it's logging, hey, I have this error, then you're also able to include the message ID or the trace ID or you know, whatever it is. Um, it's also valuable for things like context deadlines. So um, context is very robust um, in that you can add things like context deadlines. So you can add timeouts to otherwise you know, normal function calls. So it, this is very common in the RESTful library um, where you might make a request um, and be able to uh, really, uh, you know, s cut it off if it takes too long. So if you're making a request to Redis and you say, well, this should come back in, you know, five seconds, absolutely, then you're able to add a context deadline so that if it doesn't, you know that that service might be dead and that you should bail out faster. Um, and the last uh, do recommendation is always assume whenever you have a function that accepts context that that context is blank, um, that it doesn't have any data on it. If you can assume that and your function still works, then you've written it correctly. All right, so let's talk about our testing paradigm um, here at CrowdStrike, or at least part of our testing paradigm for our asynchronous uh, pipeline. Um, first, we're going to talk about no-op services, um, or noop services, if you pronounce it that way. Um, uh, so our pipeline, like I said, we handle trillions of messages. Um, we handle over a trillion messages a day. We have massive data lakes. Um, and so we cannot mock every permutation of a message. We have such a wide variety and expansive scope of our messages and the potential data that we might get off of these because these are from you know, sensors, computers, servers all over the world from all different developers, backgrounds, people, um, companies that might send us different data. So it is virtually impossible to mock all of the potential permutations of that uh, message. So we mock the services. Um, we have the ability to put up two instances of a single service um, and that we're actually able to use that um, to deploy so that they live side by side. So for instance, if you have a Kafka cluster and your service is reading off of that, um, you can simply spin up a different service or the same service with a different consumer group and it will process the same messages that the live service is doing. Um, so one of the uh, services is just your regular service, takes in data, writes to the database, writes to the next service. Easy peasy, good to go. Um, the other service is what we call a no-op service. Um, so this is something that takes in the data, it goes through all of the business logic, but when it actually goes to do any I.O., any you know, call to the network or a call to the disk um, so that it's writing, something like that, we simply skip that step and say, oh, it succeeded. Um, assuming that that service, you know, Cassandra, Redis, Kafka, whatever services you're using, is available. Um, so yeah, we call those services no-op, um, no operation instances. Um, so why? Um, so we can use this to canary some of our services. Um, if we want to deploy a no-op service, we can, or sorry, if we want to deploy a service, we can first deploy the no-op instance. So this is, allows us to put it against live data and see anything that can go wrong. 
Um, so this is really important because we're able to process all of the real world message, all of the real things that we might see coming in in our production environment. And for whatever reason, if somebody updates you know, the code, they forget to initialize a map, for instance, that can cause a panic. Um, and so we want to be able to catch that very early on before this data actually um, gets processed by anything in our system. So we're able to still rely on the existing version service that's out in the cloud, but also put up this no-op canary service um, so that we can kind of verify, oh, is it going to die under this kind of load? Um, so it can exist for a few seconds or a few days. It depends on really the change you've made as a developer um, and how long it would take you to verify, has the change I made actually succeeded in what I want it to do? Um, so how do we do that? Um, very simple. If memoir.noop um, on the context, return nil or return whatever the parameters are um, for success. Um, so this is basically checking if a value is true. If it's a no-op instance, you know, we should return assuming that we've done everything else in the business logic. Um, so for instance, uh, here is a function, uh, the no-op and context with no-op. So no-op um, just looks at the context. If it's nil or if it doesn't contain the value, it'll return the value false. Um, so when we check the context for this value, we can get a true-false. It'll only return true if the no-op was originally set as true. Uh, we see um, in the context with no-op function, this is basically adding a no-op value to the context and returning it. So if it's nil, it'll create uh, a new context off a of background, um, and then it'll add that with the value with that no-op context key. Um, now the reason we use the context key as a um, constant, um, as a specific type called uh, context key, is so that it's package specific. So it doesn't matter if another package adds the string no op true false, it won't actually be picked up by the no op function because this is looking specifically for that context key. Um, so it is only going to return for that type. Um, so we can reliably say, the only way this will beat no op is if we add it with a function context with no op. Uh, so let's take a look at a message. So this is something that we might um, have running you know, off of a queue so that whenever we get a new message in, we give the context and we give the raw data of that message. Um, in this case, we're going to unmarshal it with uh, JSON and get that into our message structure. Um, from there, we're going to check our environment variable, noop. Um, in this case, it could be an environment variable. It could be something like a RESTful you know, parameter. Um, we're going to check if it's true. And then we're going to add that to context. From there, we just call our other functions like normal. We're going to write that message to the database, and then we're going to send it to the next service with write to Kafka. Um, and we do that while passing in the context earlier that contains our noop value. So let's check that the write to Kafka um, version. This one's very, very bare bones. Um, we're just going to marshal the message again in JSON, um, and then we're going to write it to Kafka. Now, before we actually do the Kafka library write, um, we're going to check if it's no op. We're going to basically check if um, that context has that no op. If it does, then we're going to assume that we succeeded. We're not actually going to write to the next phase of Kafka. Um, we're just going to end there and say we succeeded. Um, and I, I literally just got done saying, uh, you know, don't, don't let context change fundamentally how your code works. Um, so let's first address why not a global variable? Uh, why even put it on context at all? Um, you could just have a check, you know, is this global variable true, yes or no, and then keep going from there. Uh, the reason for that is that we actually want this to be um, service specific or request specific. So we want to be able to run this service in production um, without a canary just as a standalone service and still be able to feed it messages that we want to run in no op mode. This is useful if we want to replay a message and get back what had happened um, or test something without it actually affecting production data. Um, so that's why we will use context so that we can do it on a per message per request basis. Um, and then let's address the fact that I just said Context should never fundamentally change your code. Um, and that's valid. Uh, so I would argue that this is actually 
uh, not fundamentally change in the code because of how it's placed in the code. You only want this to change your criteria for success on saving to a database or sending a message. Um, so as opposed to other instances where you're going to just check the error, does it succeed or not, um, we want to be able to say, um, you know, this would have succeeded and our only criteria that has changed because of this context is our uh, recognition of whether or not it would have succeeded. So that really comes down to where you put it. Um, so this is exactly where you want to put it um, on the uh, left hand side of the screen, the one with the green check mark, is all of your logic. So you know you have some write to database function that takes in context, takes in the message, um, and you want to be able to look at it, make sure it's the right type, for instance, or make sure it has a field. Um, make sure that that field is valid. Um, and then call your no op before you do something like insert it to the database. Um, you do all this so that if you mess up the code somewhere, if you are trying to um, change the code so that it's um, more, uh, more robust, or maybe you're changing the field that might handle, that's the thing that you're really checking when you're checking a no op, is how it handles the real message, the core business logic of what you're doing. Um, so once you've gotten through that core business logic, then you're good to go. What you don't want to do is put it at the beginning of a function or ahead of you know, some method um, that you don't really uh, check for, for validity. So in the, the second case where we just immediately no-op out of there, it, we could actually have caused a panic once this gets out of no-op mode because maybe it's not a, a map streaming interface. Maybe it doesn't have a field ID or maybe that field's not a string. Or really any number of business logic checks that you need to do prior to writing to the database. If you check your no-op before all of these, then you could have deployed bad code and you won't really recognize that. But if you do it just before you do that uh, disk I.O. or network I.O., then you're, you're in a much safer place. All right, let's talk about step two, API injection. Um, so uh, we talked about how asynchronous services can be very hard to test because they're very, very intricate. They, they have a lot of different layers to them, and it can be very difficult to kind of go through those different layers um, and really, really get to the, the root of the problem. But RESTful response requests Super easy. Also gRPC or really any kind of request response service. Super easy to test. You give it data, you get back data. See what happens. Um, so we're going to just use that uh, paradigm. This is a very, very simple hack really um, to be able to test your asynchronous pipelines that you use the same code that's coming in on your uh, asynchronous pipeline and you treat it like a syn synchronous request response structure. Um, so we'll just set up an API handler um, and then pass that off to the message handler, the same one that we, we're using with whatever queuing service we're using. Um, so actions that are returned inside the handler, we want to return to the API caller. So what we're going to do is we're going to have an API injection service. You give it a message as if it came off the queue, and then it's going to take that message um, and it's going to replay it um, into the, the pipeline, into the message handler, and it's going to make a record, make essentially what's a trace of all the actions that it's going to take, saying that, oh, you know, I would have written to the database, I would have written to Kafka, I would have written to Redis, um, I would have written to, you know, any number of services, um, downstream, upstream, you know, whatever. Um, and so it's able to kind of return that trace back to you. All right, so let's look at uh, what that might look like. Um, so this is just uh, the RESTful uh, handler. So this is you know pretty common format for Go um, for different REST services. Um, there's a lot of different you know opinions about how you should structure your RESTful uh, handler functions. We're not going to get into that in this talk. This is a very basic example. Um, but first, you know, just read off the message off the request body. Um, we're going to check for that um, no op value. So in this case, we're going to check if the no-op URL parameter is true. So this way, a requester can actually set no-op if they want this request to run in no-op mode, or if they want to run it in a standard operation mode. So they actually want it to write to the database or the next service. Um, both can be valuable for different reasons, and really it's up to you as a developer or as a tester to determine which one works better for you. 
Um, this next one, we're going to create a new data structure. We're calling it a memoir. Um, I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but we're going to create a just you know a Go pointer, and we're going to add that to the context. And this is going to be the thing that we populate with all of those calls. You know, I wrote to the database. I wrote to Kafka. I wrote to you know the cache. All of these things are going to be saved in that memoir because we're going to pass it into context in the handle message, and then we're going to encode it as the response to our RESPA request. So that memoir that will contain all of the actions the handler did or would have taken, um, and we're able to send that back. So we're able to verify that our service is actually operating the way, the way we expect it to. All right, let's get into memoirs. What is a memoir? Um, it's a historical account. Um, it's basically something like a, a journal or a log or a trace. It is in the same realm in that it is gathering data up for all of the operations that have taken place in a way that makes sense that you can send it back. Um, so we need to uh, record everything it's doing. Um, yeah. Um, so we need to record everything that a service is doing um, and that we need to be able to put that onto context and have downstream services decorate it, assuming that a memoir is present on context. Um, we're not going to use memoirs at all um, in terms of our production code. No downstream code will open up a memoir, see what happened before it. This is going to be the same way, you know, no service looks at the logs that came before it or really, you know, the traces that came before it. This is purely for the response that we're building up for this RESTful response. That is the only consumer of it um, and that's why we're, we're doing it. Now because it'll only operate on this memoir when it's in context, it becomes super cheap to run in production because when we don't have an asynchronous uh, or sorry, when we do have an asynchronous message come through, we simply don't attach a memoir. So all of these fields, all of these events that we're adding to it will not actually take up any memory because we're not actually adding it because the memoir doesn't exist. Um, so we're able to run through and do everything at scale, but every time we make an API request, we're able to get a very rich um, data context off of that message and all of the traversals that it's done. All right, so let's make some memoir. So a memoir is just a very simple structure. Um, this has a channel um, of a slice. In this case, I used an empty interface. In your application, I would highly recommend using a common structure, things like service name, host name, you know, data, logs, trace ID, things like that, um, that is much more specific to your needs um, in terms of what you want this memoir to contain. But if you're you know, doing a GopherCon talk, you just want something generic, uh, then you can use an empty interface. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, when we initialize this memoir, we simply create the new memoir structure. Um, we create a channel of length one, um, and then we put a single array onto that channel. Uh, we do this so that it's uh, much more thread safe, um, so that whenever we go and add an event, we can pull this array or this slice off of the channel. We can append to it whatever event we want to append to it and then put it back on the channel. In this way, we can have a common pointer that has this channel structure and we can constantly be updating it and appending it um, in a thread safe way. So if we branch out, we do multiple Go routines with a common context, with a common memoir. Um, as they update events, we're able to get that um, in a thread safe way, relatively in order. There might be uh, a race as to, you know, which one comes first if there happened to be a, you know, something in a Go routine. Sometimes you might, let's say, write to two caches um, and you might write to one first and the other second because they're in a Go routine or vice versa. Um, and then finally, when we actually go to marshal this, when we're actually marshaling the uh, memoir structure, um, we have a custom, custom JSON marshaller. Um, and this allows us to kind of uh, supersede the, the Marshall function so that whenever we call um, Marshall JSON, um, it will take all of the events off of that channel, it will marshal them as a JSON event, and then we defer um, putting that back onto the channel so that our, we're constantly able to keep updating this even after we marshal the JSON. And then totally thread safe, really easy to use. Uh, all right, so. Uh, let's look at the context with memoir and the from context. This is very similar to our no op instance. 
Um, surprise, you thought you were learning about async architectures. It's actually more about context. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, we're using the context key again. In this, you know, we have memoir, and we're simply updating it um, to allow context with memoir. So we put a new memoir on there. If not, we create one. Um, we make sure that the channel has been initialized, and we're putting it into the context. Um, later on, we're able to take it from context um, and really just store it up. Now, you'll notice that from context, if context is nil or um, if the memoir isn't actually present on context, it will return a nil memoir. Um, that's totally OK. Um, and that's because in our previous one, before we check any of these, we're checking, you know, is, you know, when we add, for instance, um, we're checking, is the memoir nil? Um, are the events nil? If you know, they are, return nothing. It's fine. We don't need to add to this. We don't need a memoir on this. And because we only call the Marshall JSON in our RESTful function, we really only need to check the events field. Although, you know, it's probably good practice. I should update this to if m equals nil. Uh, all right. So let's go to, back to this handle REST function. So just like before, we're reading off the body into a message. We're checking the noop. We add the noop to context. Um, but then we're also going to add the memoir to context. Um, so it's the same thing as before, add memoir new, um, and then we pass that into the handle message function. This handle message function, uh, again, is the same thing that we're using to process all of the data off the queue. So you know, we'll process this from Kafka or from this RESTful command. Either way, the only difference is that if it's from the RESTful command, we'll have a noop and we'll have a memoir. Um, and now our write to Kafka function will add in that memoir. This is a very simple you know, instance. In this case, we're just adding a string. Um, but you can add very complex data structures or you know, much more robust things to your memoir in order to be able to better debug and kind of process that. Um, so we marshal the message. And just before we check our no-op, we're saying that we are writing to this Kafka topic, and this is the message that we are writing. Um, this is very important because it allows us to then take all the messages that we would have written to all these services and kind of get them in that RESTful response. Um, so let's put it all together. So uh, going back to that service, um, A goes to B goes to C goes to A goes to D and E. Um, all of these services um, can contain API injection and memoirs and no-ops. So we're able to very cleanly go through the structure and actually see it all put together. Um, so we're able to you know, take in a message to A, and then get the response back, and go to B, and go to C. So it becomes much less asynchronous, uh, and much more synchronous in the purpose of testing. So this is great. Um, so first, uh, we have our testing program. This could be a CLI. This could be something that's you know, in your CIDC fine. Um, or really just you know, random engineer going through to test things manually. Um, I do this all the time. If I'm testing out a change locally and I want to just send it something, I'll you know, spin up a, a small CLI to send RESTful requests and then get the responses and see, see where it goes. Um, so fairly straightforward. They're all synchronous responses, but you go A to B, and then A sends back that it would have written something to B. So you go over to B. You send it that message, then go over to C, send it that message. Um, and you go down the pipeline constructing your messages from the actual services that come before it. Uh, this is really important because it really allows um, you to go through your services. And if there's any change, like let's say two services both had a version update within a very short time you know, of each other, they might have had this, uh, you know, they might have uh, still had the same uh, services going, uh, talking to each other. They might have, uh, needs to deal with integration tests that haven't been updated. Um, and so you need to find out where in the pipeline it actually fell down. Um, so in this case, um, we, we really want to be able to, to test them um, and see that did it actually get from A to B? Did it get from B to C? Um, and are those messages legitimate? So we can have a lot of confidence that the messages we're sending between these services are the literal messages. They're not mocks. They're actually what would go in. We're also able to check things like the database writes and email sends. So for instance, if you are wondering why 
I, you know, I'm writing it to the database, but why isn't it available after a couple of days? And you find out that you know, there was a, a time to leave stamp that was incorrectly calculated. That, that could be a bug that you actually find prior to deploying any of these in production environments. Because you can do this in a, a test environment, or you can uh, deploy it as a canary, and see what the actual data coming through is. Now, this is also really valuable for blue-green testing. Um, so if you're testing in the case of a blue-green deployment, that's where you have two instances of the same service, and you want to verify that they're each behaving as expected. Um, so you can send in a message you know, to your version 1 and your version 2, or your version blue and green, um, and really see, oh, I sent this message into A, I got back a response, um, and then I sent a message into uh, you know, A 2.0, and I got back a different response. And you're able to actually analyze either automatically or manually, is the change valid? Um, is there any change at all? Um, and can I expect that this would be an appropriate uh, context? Um, so really, that's the, the core of how we've begun and really uh, you know, motivate us to test our asynchronous pipeline. Um, so it's allowed us to be incredibly robust in the fact that we are handling you know, trillions of messages in our system in a given week. We are handling millions, you know, tens of millions of messages a second. Um, and that really allows us to have a high confidence in our production so that we can deploy stuff out and we can guarantee it's not going to have downtime because we're a security company. We can't afford to drop any detections. We can't you know, afford to have this kind of thing where uh, you know, we, we leave messages on the floor because that could be the, the million dollar message. That could be the thing that you know, saves you know, however many customers from however many breaches. Uh, we really uh, value um, our, our customers, and we really make sure that we, we strive to uh, give them the best possible delivery because our core business is stopping breaches. <laughs>